Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be the name.
Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling.
Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Bow down before him. For he is Lord of all. Sing
147 and 3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. So, Father, we stand on your word this morning, God, and we ask that you will heal the brokenhearted. God, we ask that you will bind up the wounds, Lord. God, we lift up the needs in the bulletin. God, we ask that you just meet every need represented there. God, you know what the needs are. And God, we just thank you for answering these needs. Lord, we also lift up Margaret McWaters as she has had a stroke. She's in the hospital. God, we ask that you bring complete restoration to her mind and her body. Lord God, we ask for peace for her. God, we ask for peace for her family. God, we lift up Calder Kenny and Bobby, Bobby Kenny. God, we ask for complete restoration of Brother Calder's mind, God, and his body. Lord, we ask for complete restoration of Miss Bobby's body, Lord. God, we ask for peace for them. God, we ask for provision for them, Lord. God, any need that is on our hearts this morning that we have not made public, God, you know what that need is, and we bring those needs to you as well, Father. And God, I pray that you'll just anoint the service this morning, God, as Mike brings your word. I pray that you'll just anoint him to bring that word that you've laid on his heart. God, I pray that you'll just prepare our hearts to receive and our ears to hear what you have for us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And well, uh, this Sunday... Uh, we're going to be talking about, it'll be part three and the last part of seeing your future. And many times when you, when you hear that term, seeing your future, you think there's going to be some sort of uh, reading of the palm or something like that. But this is even better than that. This is consistent. This is precise. And this is truth. This is not opinion. This is not what if. This is truth. And it's all based out of the word of God. So if you've missed the first two parts of of the, of the series, Seeing Your Future. Uh, it's on the internet, it's on YouTube, it's on Vimeo, it's on disc, it's on the, uh, your, your phone app, uh, smartphone app. So it shouldn't be a problem with getting a, getting a copy of it, listening to it. I feel like the Lord wants you to know that you have a future. And so part of what I've been wanting to convey to you is you seeing the biblical truths in the Word of God and to encourage you to look forward to your future. Many people are surviving today and just going through life and really don't see that they have a future. They think that this is all there is to life. But no matter your age, when you're living and breathing like we all are today, 
that means that God has something even more and greater for us in the days to come. Amen. Do you believe that? So I want to talk about that and wrap this series up today, but I believe this is a very, very important part of the series. The part one in the series we talked about getting close to Jesus. How many know that, that the inventor of who we are today knows all about us, knows every intricate detail, good and bad, the, your regrets, your, your, uh, your plus sides, your minus sides, all those things. Jesus knows all those things and he still loves you. And the first thing we have to do to see our future is to gl- get close to Jesus. And then in part two, we talked about following Jesus. We need to get close to him, but we need to follow him. That means it's a daily routine of following him, making him part of our life. Just like your arm is part of your life and your feet's part of your life, make Jesus the same way, same part of your life. We talked about following Jesus, but then we looked at the definition of that. Jesus actually defined follow and what it means to follow him. We talked about that in part two. So this week will be part three. And, and I, want to, I want to help you know that you have a future. What does no mean? No means that you have a continual awareness Continual awareness, whatever you know, is that you have a continual awareness of what that is. So if if I can help you think about your continual awareness of your future, I believe it will positively impact and change your life every single day of your life because you're always anticipating your future. And Jesus wants you to do that. Amen? Let's read out of our key scripture, 2 Corinthians 4.18. We'll pray and then we'll get into what I feel like the Lord wants me to say today. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says this, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that we have it. It's like going on a trip with a map. With the navigation. Father, you're our navigation. Your word is that to us today. And Lord, I pray that you'll lead us into a truth today that will change our life. Help us to have ears to hear what you're saying. And Lord, the heart that you will plant that seed in us, Lord, that it will grow. Draw us close to you in Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. Amen. I've shared over these last almost eight years of of experiences that I've had in life, uh, from from my mother's passing at age 13 to having a life-threatening heart attack when I was 18, then given three to five years to live, shouldn't have lived past 23 years old. So I know what it means to face difficult things in life and all along the way. And, and, then, and then other situations, uh, our oldest, Josh, he's now 30, had a four-wheeler accident. He nearly lost his life uh, at 18. Jordan was 19 years old when she was discovered she had a brain tumor and wasn't given the promise of tomorrow, had brain surgery at Emory. They went in endoscopically, uh, endoscopically and, and removed all that they could of that tumor, said that she may not be normal. So I know what it is to face things in life that are challenging and are difficult. I, I remember we, would, we, we had, a, had our honeymoon in St. Augustine, and we'd go to St. Augustine almost every year. And, and uh, for the first few years of our marriage, I was always on edge because I didn't know when my heart would stop beating. And so it was, it was a challenge for me to go somewhere, and if I felt some more sort of strange sensation, I thought that was the end. And so I lived my daily life expecting for that to be my last heartbeat. And so uh, I had to grow through and go past that. I, I didn't want to do a whole lot because I was scared that I'd be in the company of some people and would die. And that would be awkward, not necessarily for me, but maybe for them. <laughs> so, so I know what it is to go through difficult situations in life. And when those difficult situations in life seem so big and seem so large that it's hard to look beyond that. This past week we were up in uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. We we rented a house there so that Josh and uh, Kendra and Silas and Zelda um, and then Jordan and Tim and Bailey, they were all able to come down. We were able to be together this week and and uh, be together as a family, celebrate Thanksgiving, deep fry turkey on Thursday, and do all that. And, and uh, well, Tim and Jordan came in uh, Monday night, and Jordan, uh, Josh, and Kendra didn't come in until Tuesday night. We arrived Sunday night. And so Tim and Jordan says, uh, they called Monday and say, we think we're going to come on in tonight. Uh, Tim wants to know if you'd like to play golf tomorrow, which would be Tuesday morning. And I said, absolutely. So Tim and I got on the phone, and we worked out. He, uh, he, he got us into a golf club there in, uh, in Myrtle Beach. And so... 
uh, and it was beautiful. It was unlike our golf courses here because you could actually drive the golf cart through the sand, bar, sand pits and, and those type things. So it was a little bit different. But something else that was different about this particular course, the die course, D-Y-E, which I think's a golf pro up there. Um, uh, Davis Love also has a, has a course there. There are four courses at this club. Anyway, we got on the die course. And, uh, and in these courses, there were a lot of sand, sand pits, but there were also a lot of hills. And a couple of these holes were uh, nearly 500 yards long. And they were tricky, and dog leg left, dog leg right. You were hitting them over marsh, hitting them over water. And, and, um, and, and some, some of those particular holes where we, were, where we were hitting and playing, we weren't able to see even beyond the hills. The, the hill was just kind of staring us in the face. And so we're, uh, um, I, I have a real challenging time hitting the ball anyway. And then when you've got something challenging staring you in the face, it makes it even more interesting. But, but as we hit the ball, we would, we would come upon a hill and really couldn't see where we were going. Couldn't see past the hill. Didn't really know, if you want to know the truth, if there was a hole on the other side of the hill or not. And so as we were playing this course and playing through and, and, and had a lot of fun, had a great time Tuesday, uh, I got to thinking about what I was talking about today. And many times in life, we get so focused on what we're looking at. We get so focused on the challenge. We get so focused on the problem and the situation that we lose sight of the fact and the truth that there is something beyond the hill. There's something on the other side of that. And if we just are diligent in working toward getting past that, and, and, um, and it took a lot of patience on my part. Of course, it took a lot of patience on Tim's part, too, for me to work through some of these holes that we were hitting through there. But as we did that, as we were persistent, and as I think about how that compares and, and how it actually parallels to life, we have to do the same thing. We have to see that, that we have to look beyond, as we just read a while ago in the Scripture in, in Corinthians, that... We can't see with our physical eyes. If we look at life, if we look at a life in our physical eyes, we see it's not that that's not factual, but it's not truth. There's a difference between facts and truth. Facts change. Facts fluctuate. Because that hill may be there later. That situation may be there tomorrow, and it may be gone. So if we base our life on the fact of that situation, then we're basing our life on something that's that could change. If we base our life on truth and understand that there's something beyond that hill, then, then we can focus our life on something that's truth and real and will never change. Truth does, the word of God never changes. So as we pattern our life and, and as I was thinking this week and parallel on that to, to that fun golf game we had last week and how challenging that is, many times life can be challenging. It can be overwhelming. It can be, and some of you maybe are here today and you've, you've realized that I don't know what I'm going to do because that thing is staring you in the face today. But let me tell you, there's a future beyond the challenge. God wants you to know that. I want to encourage you in that. What did I do in the golf game? How did I do? I did great. I did great because it was beautiful sunshine. It was green grass. The fairways, the, uh, the greens were in beautiful shape. I had a great time. It was a lot of... A lot of good fellowship and talking and things like that. In the Bible, it talks about a person named Joseph. I've, I've actually preached a sermon on Joseph before, but if you recall, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, 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 on Joseph today, but if you recall, Joseph had a dream. And he was so excited about this dream that, that he went and told everybody his dream. And so as he told everybody, he, he didn't know any better. He was just so excited. He, he had enthusiasm in his, in his heart, and he, he, he was excited that God was going to use him. He was going to have this great future, and he believed the dream. But as he believed the dream, he acted in that dream, and, and he, he patterned his life as though he were going for that dream. He didn't pattern his life as though, well, that was just a dream that may or may not ever happen, so I'm just going to live the way that I would normally live. No, that dream changed Joseph's life. And everything that he did in life, everything that he, every step he took, everything that he thought about was always with that dream in mind. I don't believe that Joseph ever made anything happen. I believe that he knew that he needed God in order for that dream to be fulfilled. But what he did experience in his life was a lot of pain, a lot of frustration, and many years of people fighting him because they knew the dream too. And as Joseph lived through those things, lived through those challenges, lived through people trying to kill him, lived through people uh, trying to divert him, purposely diverting him, his own family, his brothers, those that you thought would have stuck with him and would have been proud of him, 
they were the very ones that were spearheading him taking uh, a side road and not fulfilling his dream that he had already shared. But Joseph never, ever lost sight of the dream. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to visualize our future. Joseph was able to visualize his future. He, he could see it. He could see it. You know, some, some people can, can, can see something uh, completely finished when there's nothing there. And other people really, can you draw that for me? Can you paint that for me so I can visualize it? But God wants us to develop a, a visual in our minds of our future. And I'll tell you this, as you do that, make sure it's from God. But as you do that, God will always exceed that visual that you see. He will always surpass that. So, so visualize big. Visualize your dream. Visualize what you want to accomplish in life. It's going to always be something that, that, that God, I feel like, has placed a seed in your heart just as Joseph did. But we have to have a dream in view. We've got to have a dream in our life to where our life is really going toward that dream. There will be times that you will see that dream and then, and then you'll, you'll say to yourself, well, that's, I dream too big. That's really not obtainable. Don't ever say that. Every dream is possible. There are going to be some things that we need to look at, make sure that they're God-led dreams, but in those, God will always not only fulfill it, but he will always succeed it. God has a future for you. There's more to your life than what you're experiencing right now. Proverbs 29, 18 says in New King James Version, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Another translation says, where there's no vision, the people perish. The Hebrew interpretation of the word revelation is a dream or vision. So that's really what we're talking about today. That's what the Bible is speaking of, where there's no vision where there's no revelation, people die. People die, sometimes physically, but many times they, they die emotionally. They have no hope. They're hopeless. They're helpless. So having a dream or a vision is important to your life. And I want to give you three things in your life that the vision will bring. Three things in your life that vision will bring. The first one is focus. When you have a vision or a dream develop in your heart and in your life, it will bring focus. Focus means, this is the meaning of focus, it's the state or quality of having or producing clear visual definition. Let me read that again. The quality of having or producing clear visual definition. Clear visual definition, that's focus. Focus, see, focus helps us get out of the way any distractions. Focus helps us look beyond the distractions. Focus helps us see beyond what we're currently are seeing. When we're focused, when we're focused, all the things that kind of go on around us in our peripheral that try to distract us and pull us away, when you're really focused, when you really have a visual definition of what you're going for, going after, all those things really won't have any bearing on you. Those things really won't have any impact on you. You can still be in a pit you can still be uh, sold as a slave. You know, if we were to put that in, in today's terms, you could still be taken advantage of by your friends. You could still be looked over by your family. You could still be uh, uh, taken not seriously. You could, all these things could still happen in your life, but you could be so focused that those things have no impact or no direct influence on your life to discourage you in any way. Focus, for me was learning when to say no. Because used to, anytime I was asked to do something, I thought I had to do it. So I'd say yes to everything. So I was saying yes to all these things that other people wanted me to do, but what it was actually doing, it was taking, taking my, my place and my focus off of what I felt like my dream was, what God's dream was for my life, and was distracting me. And it was good things, but I would say yes because I couldn't say no. Focus will help, help us to be able to say no. It's not God's purpose for you to do everything. It's not God's purpose for me to do everything. There will be times that we have to say no in order to keep our focus. And I respect that of you. If there's, if there's a time that, that I 
asks something of you or whatever, it's, it's always okay. Now, it's not okay to say no just because you don't feel like you're good enough to do it. It's not okay to say no just because um, you're afraid to get out of your comfort zone. So that's, that's another message for another day for another time. What I'm saying is that as long as we've got our focus in line with God and our focus in line with where we're going in our future, it's okay to say no sometimes. I was given the opportunity in just the last few weeks to, to be the president of a, of a ministerial association, and these guys had asked me two or three times to do that, and I said no every time because that's not, that's not my focus. I'm part of it. I want to attend the meetings. We pray together. We, we meet on a regular basis. Uh, this is outside of FCMI. You know, you, you know the FCMI, Fellowship of Ministers and Churches International, is, is our covering and the, church, and the covering of many ministers and churches. And, and so that's certainly part of us. And I've been the president of that now for four or five years and honored to do that. But this is an additional ministerial association that really would flow right in. It could flow right into what we're doing and where we are. But I, I didn't feel like it's as good as it was. That, that I think that would be good for you to do, Pastor Mike. Well, it would if, if that's what I wanted to do. It, it would if, if, that, if that was in focus with what I, where I was headed in, in my future. But you see what I'm saying. There will be times that even good things in your life that you'll have to say no to because it's not part of your future. It's not part of where you're going. And so we need to learn that sometimes to stay focused. Our focus is necessary to keep us on the right track. If, if, we, if we lose focus many times, uh, it could take us off of the right track. It could be a good thing, but where are we going? Where is your future? Like I said, develop a picture. And this would come through prayer and through time with the Lord and reading the Word of God and, and some of the maybe the passions and talents that's already part of your life. Use those things and find out where your passion is and let God speak to you and, and allow God to take that to your future. Now, God wants to bless you in every way in your future. So whatever and wherever you go, it's going to be a good thing as long as God is involved in it. But our focus helps us stay on track. Do you, you know that, that when we take our, when we're driving and we take our hands off the steering wheel and we're doing something else, I guess that's, that's why texting is, is, um, is a no-no while you're driving. When we take our focus off of what we're doing in the car, it could actually be detrimental to our life. And the lives of others. Think about that the same way in your spiritual life. That when you lose focus, it causes you to swerve. It could cause you to get off track so much that your spiritual life could be in detriment. And it could be the, to the detriment of other lives as well. Who are looking to you and who are looking for direction from your life. Focus is important. Focus, focus will help you keep your eye on the future. But it will also preserve your life right now. Do you get that? Focus will help preserve your life spiritually right now. The loss of focus in your life could cause you to go down a path that could cause detriment to your life. Focus helps you accomplish. Focus helps you manage. The most important thing that we have, no matter what your age is, the, important, the most important thing we have is time. Time. And without managing your time, and I've had to learn to do that. I've, I've had to learn to do that with, with responsibilities and, and with my heart for people and love to help people and those and, 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 and all that, that's connected to that. I have to be able to manage time and, and that takes work to do that. Focus will help us manage our time. Focus will help us manage and be productive and to accomplish those things that we need to accomplish. Focus is important. The second thing that vision brings is endurance. Vision brings endurance. When you're able to visualize a goal, when you're able to visualize a dream in your life, you will have more endurance to throw you, to push you past discouragement, to put you past disappointment, to put you past tiredness and, and, and all those emotional things that could sit in. When you have a focus in mind, when you have a goal in mind, when you have a, a dream that you're shooting for, it's like a fire that burns in you that you will pursue through, you will push through those things. There'll be an extra endurance that you will seem to get from nowhere. When, when I was thinking and praying about this, I was thinking about athletes and, and, how, and how athletes many times, whether it's in football, basketball, uh, running, uh, all, all these things, uh, soccer, how they get to a point to where they're really physically exhausted 
But one thing happens when they remember what they're playing for and what they're, what they're uh, spending their energy for. When they keep in mind the future, there's a, there's a, a, a rush of fuel that comes into them physically swimming. Uh, all, there, there's, there's, a, there's a force of, of adrenaline that rushes through them that will push them to the finish line that, they, that many of them don't know where that came from because they didn't really have the energy physically to push forward like they did. And that happens only as they see, that endurance happens only as they see the finish line. They see what they're shooting for, what they're trying to accomplish. They are so focused that that endurance kicks in and pushes them toward that finish line. Joseph had that. As I mentioned a while ago, Joseph had such a vision and such a dream that it was such part of his life that he was going to do it. If there was breath in his body, he was going to accomplish it. He did that, and as he did, the endurance came by the power of God and gave him the ability to push through those discouraging times. Were those times discouraging? I'm sure. Can you imagine the things that Joseph faced and went through with his family and, 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 and being sold as a slave and, and all the challenges that he faced in life? All of that, he had an endurance to push him through to the end, to make him to where he saw the provision that God set before him. And did you know that it was, it was everything that he's dreamed that it would be and more? When you're moving and advancing toward your goal, there's going to be, God's going to give you a supernatural power to cause you to uh, successfully see that thing come to pass in your life as you pursue him. I remember when, when uh, and it seems like just a couple of years ago, I remember when Jordan, uh, when uh, Crystal was pregnant with Josh and Crystal was pregnant with Jordan. And guys, we, we have a hard job too. I mean, we... We, we, we have a difficult job. We've got to stand there and hold the hand and, and, uh, and, uh, and comfort them and all that. But, uh, but I'll give it to the ladies. The ladies have a hard job too. You know, they, they have to, uh, to, to, to bring forth this child anyway. I'm just kidding. But um, as Crystal was pregnant with Josh and Jordan, she had one goal in mind. That was to deliver this child, number one, and secondly, hold that child in her arms. And the entire time she's pregnant, those nine months and getting big and, and all the changes in her body, what was in her mind pushing through and enduring through the pain and the agony and the sleepless nights and all the things that come with a lady being pregnant, all those things, she was able to endure that and push through to the end to see her goal. And that was to deliver this healthy child and be able to hold it. That's the way it is in life. Think of yourself as, as being impregnated with a great future, something that God wants you to do, something that God wants you to fulfill and to do, and your purpose in life to be fulfilled. And think of that as you go through life in pain, and you go through agony, and you go through changes. All, I mean, it, it correlates so well. Uh, I preached a message a few years ago on New Year's Eve and talked about the stages of pregnancy and how that parallels to our spiritual life. It really does. Our, uh, the, the lady giving birth to a child, it's such a rejoicing time, but the pain to get there is agony. But as she pushed through, and, and, and you ladies who have children, as you pushed through and, and, and saw that child being born and the rejoicing that comes in, the happiness, you forget all about the pain. Because why? Because you've reached your goal. You have that beautiful, healthy child in your arms. That's the way it is with God's plan for you. God wants to bring forth something out of your life that's bigger than you are. And he's chosen you to do it. You're special to God. God has a, a, a special interest in every single one of you. And he's calls things around you, probably 99% of the things around you, you don't even see and don't even realize that God's calls around you to bring you to the place where you are today. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. And so I, I have the honor to be able to, to see what God's doing in your life, doing through your life all because of the things that God's put around you these years to bring you to where you are today for that thing to be birthed in you. And if you allow him to, it will be birthed and it'll be great. It'll be wonderful. And you'll be glad you persevered. You'll be glad that you pushed through, but there will be an endurance. It'll be an endurance that just comes through you and gives you the power to push through even when it doesn't seem possible. And thirdly, vision brings fulfillment. Vision brings fulfillment. It's important to see the fulfillment of God-led dreams and goals, but it's also important to remember that there's going to be a love and a passion for it in the meantime. As difficult as the path may be, 
you need to remember that God will give you a love for doing what you're doing along the way as well. There'll be a love, there'll be a passion, and it'll all come to a fulfillment. There are many times that we find ourselves in places, the wrong places, trying to get a fulfillment out of those things rather than fulfillment out of God-led vision, goals, and dreams. And so if we look to things or places or people for fulfillment in life, it all seems like dead in streets. And then we become discouraged because those things were disappointing and hurtful. Well, rightly so, because that's not your future. There, there are many things that we can pursue today. And if it's not God's intended future for you, you will not find fulfillment in it. There will be, there will be happiness possibly in, in it for a season. There will be joy in it for a season. There will be pleasure in it for a season. But unless it's God's intended purpose for you, it will be a dead end street and will leave you disappointed, hurt, and discouraged. And let me say, that is not God's plan for your life. I was talking to somebody the other day and... and um, they told me about a dream that they had and they, they called and wanted to talk about it and, and they told me it was a, it was a bad dream and it was, it was scary. And so they wanted to know what I thought that it was. And I said, well, did you say that it involved death? Did you say it involved fear? Did you say it in, involved um, uh, weighing you down? And the answer was yes. And I said, well, let me say first, that was not God. God is none of those things. God is peace, love, joy. Now, that doesn't mean that there will not be heartache along the way. There will be heartache along the way. Joseph experienced that. We're experiencing that. I've experienced that firsthand. We, we've lived through it. But all those are no excuses to pull away from God and say, God, you've caused all these things. God does not cause all the things in life. Many times, life brings those things into our life. Life does bring death into our life that we have to deal with, uh, even prematurely, you know. Um, I don't, I don't believe some people would say, well, God took your mom early at 35 years old. I don't believe God took my mom, but God used the situation where God was taken out early to bring blessing to my life, to bring blessing to my life that I met crystal that I wouldn't normally have met that we're here today, you know, 32 and a half, almost 33 years later being married and two children and three grandchildren and, and all the things that we're giving thanks for. And, and you're part of my life, all these things had my mom not passed away, and I'm not, I'm not saying, wow, I'm glad my mom died. I'm just saying that God took that bad situation, that what Satan meant for harm, and he turned around for good. There's a fulfillment when you follow God that you will not experience any other way. And know that God is not part of death. God is not part of disappointment. God is not part of hurt. He has nothing to do with those things in your life that has brought you to that place. All the things in my life, he never was a part of bringing those things to my life. But what he is was, what, what God is and what God was during those times, he was with me and helped push me through to where we continued on and continued in the future that God had for me. That's the only reason I'm standing before you today is because God in his glory and his mercy and his grace and his love brought me to where I am today and brought you to where you are today that we can stand here and testify of the goodness of God. And I'm, I just want to tell you today that that we're not finished yet, that there's more of those blessings to come. If you really think about the situations that God has brought about in your life and God has brought about in my life, I mean, it just overwhelms me how God is good to me. And why would he withhold any good thing from you as, as you are a child of his? It would be like me withholding anything good from our children or grandchildren just because I want to see them suffer. That doesn't, that, that's not a good, good father, is it? That's not a loving father. God wants to bestow on you every blessing that he has. There's a timing for those blessings. There's a timing. God wants you to grow up to be a, a strong, mature child, not a spoiled brat. And so I remember growing up, and even as an adult, there were some things that I had to wait for. There's some, some things that I had to push for and, and work for, and that was building character in me. That was building patience in me and all those things, that those dirty words that we don't like to talk about. But it's really part of us being a mature individual and a character for Jesus Christ. Those things are important. It's, it's, it's like a healthy garden, you know. We, you don't go out and on a little plant like this and go out and dump 20 gallons worth of water on it every hour. If you do, you'll drown the sucker. I mean, there, there's, it's not going to live. But, it, but if you give a little by little, a little fertilizer, a little water, it begins to grow up and mature. But you have to do it in measure, in increments, a little alone. As it gets bigger, there's more required. 
fulfillment, fulfillment. Where does our vision come from? I alluded to this a while ago. It requires us to spend time with God. God knows who we are. God created us. If, if we take the inventor of, of the greatest thing in the world, you take, take the airplane and, and the Wright brothers, uh, they, they created this airplane. The, the, first, the first one that jumped in that seat to fly it would not have called his pharmacist and said, hey, how should I fly this airplane? The pharmacist has no clue. See what I'm saying? The one that invented that plane knew that thing inside and out, upside down, one or the other. Jesus Christ knows you. And what better place to go for your, your future and the details of your future and the dreams? We don't have to know all the details how to get us there, but we just need to know that there's a purpose for our life. What better place to get that from than the inventor, the one that put us all together, the one that intricately put breath in our lungs and blood in our veins. He's where we need to go to spend time with to say, God, what is it that you have for me to do? You've, you've put these passions in me. You have this desire in me. I remember when Josh was studying to be an English teacher. He, came, he was in middle school and knew that he was going to be an English teacher. I'm thinking, Josh, think of something practical, buddy. Think of something like an accountant. Think, think of something you know, that, that you should... And so Josh, middle school and then high school, I'm going to be an English teacher. And then he started, uh, he did uh, his, his um, freshman year in college here while he was doing his senior year in high school. He stayed over through the summer. He went to summer class. Then after he was here two years, he went to UGA and got his master's. I said, well, okay. I, I never questioned him. I'm thinking, go, buddy, go, buddy, go, buddy. But, man, English, English. But he had, he had a focus. He, he knew where he was going. He knew what he was going to accomplish. He, as a young child, he, and I can't say that I knew that. I didn't know when I was a little, you know, when I was in middle school what I was going to do necessarily. I'd have been fine driving go-karts the rest of my life when I was in middle school, you know. That changed a little as I got older. But God will instill something in you as you spend time with him that will be a passion that will that, that will line up to, to what you're interested in. He created you uniquely, and, and, uh, and if he could take a Murray and make an English professor out of him to teach other kids how to speak and write in English, he can do anything. You know, South Georgia on top of that. It's just not what we're known for. <laughs> but some would say, well, prosperity. Prosperity will give me my fulfillment. That's what I want prosperity. I want, to, I want to do well. Did you know that God wants you to prosper? God wants you to do well. God wants to give you all these things in life that you want, but there again, they're going to come in timing. It's not that God's going to hold anything from you, but he wants to make sure that your focus is in the right direction. And when God thinks of prosperity, he's not thinking necessarily of money. Money is not necessarily the prosperity that God's thinking of. Although he wants you to have that, that's not the point. That's not the basis of God saying, I want you to prosper. When, when the Lord speaks of him prospering you, he wants you to know who he is. That's the prosper. And as we know who he is and know the power that he has in our life and knows how he can change our life and how we can't live without him as we know him, then these other things will be added. That's what it says in Matthew. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first Jesus and his way. And then all these, it says all these things. It doesn't say some of these things are only particular things or, uh, you know, it, it's, I remember going to the dentist when I was a, a kid, Austin, and, and when I went in there um, back then, Dr. Sermons, Dr. Sermons was my dentist back then when I was a kid, and, I, and we'd go to this toy box and we could get anything there we wanted. Well, there wasn't always something that I wanted in there. I wanted something else. Where's that other thing that I saw that cost, you know, $75 from JCPenney? What was that? You know, where, why wasn't that in the basket? So, it's not that some things will be added to you, Jesus said. He said that all these things, whatever you have need of, whatever you have desire for, all these things, if you seek him first, will be added. That's the prosperity that God wants you to have. First and foremost is to know him, to know who he is, to have a continual awareness of who he is and his plan for your life, and then all these things will be added to you. That's the prosperity. It's God's favor. It's his anointing and his power. That's the prosperity that God wants to pour on you. 
Did you know you can do unlimited things with God's favor, God's anointing, and God's power? There is no limit to what you can do with those three things. But it requires you knowing God. It requires you having him part of your life. Deuteronomy 8.18 says this, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. It goes on to say that he, that Jesus, that God may establish his covenant, which he swore to his, to, to your fathers, and it is this day. So he wants you to have wealth. He gives you the power to get wealth, but it's because he wants to establish in you his covenant. That's the purpose. And so we've always got to keep in mind, God doesn't want to hold anything back, but it's, it's when we get distracted and we, and we seek these other things, we get so enamored with doing this thing or doing that thing or getting close to this person or that person till we lose sight of who we are and where we're headed. We become distracted because we lost our focus. Our focus has got to be continually on God. Our focus has got to be continually on pursuing Him. If we lose the focus then we're not wanna, we don't have to worry about anything, accomplishing anything, I don't believe. It's, it's only through the power, the favor, the anointing, and the power of God that we can accomplish all things through him. The Bible says that all things are possible through him. That's where it all comes from. So we've got to keep our eyes on God. We've got to go to him for that dream. We've got to go to him for that future. We've got to go to him for that vision. Ephesians is a is, is, a, is a great place for us to look. If we were to look at Ephesians 1.11 today, it says, in him also we have obtained an inheritance. It's in God. Being predestined according to the purpose of him. He's our purpose. Who works all things according to the counsel of whose will? His will. Flip over to Ephesians 5, 8 through 18. It says this, 8 through 18 of Ephesians 5, for you were once darkness, but now you are light of the world. Isn't it interesting how many times you are called light? What does light do? Light helps, helps you see. Light not, not necessarily is blinding, but it helps you see. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now, there are certain things that light consists of, and in verse 9 it says, for the fruit of the Spirit, which is the light that abides in us, the fruit of the Spirit is goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Now, who's he talking about exposing them? He's not talking about me exposing those darkness in your life. He's talking about you exposing the darkness in your life. Many times the Lord shows me things that to pray with you about and to pray for you about, and many times you don't even know about those things. It's the Lord sharing with me only so I can be an encouragement to you, not to expose you, not to humiliate or, or embarrass anyone. I don't believe God comes to do that. But he wants you to, as a child of light, he says here in verse 5, dropping down to verse 11, that you expose those things of darkness in your life. For it is shameful even to speak of those things, which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed, those things in your life which are exposed, are made manifest by the light, the spirit of light, the Holy Spirit. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise. In other words, be careful where you walk and be careful where you go. Be careful what you focus on as you walk the path. Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming time, because the days are evil. Therefore, verse 17, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand that he has a will and purpose for your life. Understand his vision, his dream for your life. And do not be drunk with wine. In other words, don't allow your emotions and feelings to drive you, in which is dispensation but be filled with the Spirit. If we allow our feelings many times to overcome us, if, if we allow our emotions, if we allow anger or sadness or any of those things to, to prevail and to cause us to react or to be emotional about those things, and we are emotional beings, but if we allow those things to drive us, then we're allowing the wrong thing to drive us. It'll take us down a path of, away from God. So what he's saying here is, 
You use the light of the Holy Spirit that God has planted in everyone who receives Christ to help lead and guide you, to even expose those things in your life that he doesn't want part of your life. I'm going to hurry along. I want to ask you three questions that may help you. The first question is, what am I doing that I should not be doing? I think we should ask ourselves that every day. What am I doing that I should not be doing? Is there something that you're doing in life? That's or, is there something that you're pushing through just for the sake of people liking you? Is there something that you're doing that, that people expect out of you rather than what you know that you should be doing? I think it's a fair question to ask ourselves each and every day. See, our dream will only be fulfilled by doing the right things. And I'm not talking about making mistakes or, or anything like that. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to do things and, and try to tweak and try to balance and try to, to, do, to do better and, and allowing the Spirit to work in and through us. So I'm not talking about things like that. But what are you continually doing that you know, that you're aware of, that you shouldn't be doing? Don't limit your life by experiences of the past. You could be holding yourself back. You could be doing some things in your life that you shouldn't be doing, all based on past experiences or disappointments. God wants to give you a fresh start. Expose the darkness as we just read. Allow God's light to shine through. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, think right. Get your mind in order. Get your thoughts in order that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will, the dream, the plan, the vision of God. You can't live your future while walking in darkness. You can't see where you're going. You say, well, maybe, maybe I'll get there. You, you'll get somewhere, but it's not going to be where you should be headed. It's not your future. It's not your planned purpose. And so anything that holds you back is not worth staying there. If anything that's holding you back and hindering you, it's best to get it out of your life. Proverbs 4, 25 through 27 says, let your eyes look straight ahead. That's focus. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Let all your ways be established. Do not turn. Do not swerve. Remember we talked about that? Don't turn, don't swerve to the left or right. Remove your foot from evil. Second question I'd say we should ask ourselves every day is what am I doing that I should be doing? It's not only the things that we're doing wrong, but it's the things that we're not doing that's right. We take all, all the things in our life, well, I'm not doing anything that, that I shouldn't be doing, but are we doing anything that we should be doing? What things should we be doing that we're not doing? God is putting his light in us as Jesus, as Jesus is the light of the world. We are the light of the world. So he's given us opportunities. What are we doing with the opportunities that we have to spread the word? Is there more that we could be doing individually and as a church to reach the lost, reach the community, to bring people in? Are we waiting on somebody else to do it? What should I do that, that I'm not doing, that I should be doing? God wants you to move forward. James 4, 17 says this, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, it's sin. I mean, that's pretty straight, isn't it? It's not a matter of what I'm saying you should do. It's a matter of what you know that you should do that you're not doing. So don't let your feelings and emotions drive you again. Let your God-filled future dream and purpose and passion drive you and keep you on the path of focus and determination. And let God fuel that. Matthew 6, 34 says, Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things, sufficient for the day in its own trouble. The Message Bible says it this way. I love what it says, how it says it. Matthew 6, 34, the Message says, Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now, and don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever things Whatever hard things come up when that time comes. Third question is, why not start today? The things that I should be doing that I'm not doing, the things that I shouldn't be doing that I am doing, why not make today, make the decision today? Don't procrastinate anymore. At some point, I've got to make the turn, and I've got to say, okay, from this point forward, I'm going to seek God for my future. I'm going to look to Him and help him or ask him to help me go in the direction of my future. Not to be sidetracked. Not to be torn this way or that way. A lot of times all that boils down to who you're surrounding yourself with. If we make the decision today and then go back out tomorrow in the same group of people, 
Will that encourage you or will that deter you? It's important. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now, N-O-W, is the accepted time. 2 Corinthians 4, 18, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. The things which you can't see today by the power of God are the most important in your life. The things that you're looking at today, the things that you're guiding your life by today that you can actually touch and see, those things that are difficult and hard and challenging, those are not the things that you pattern your life out today. There will be trouble. There will be hardship. There will be challenges. Do not pattern your life and your future after those things. Ask God to bring you through them, bring you on the other side of the hill, and help you to see that there's a future for your life. God has a future for you. Amen? Let's bow our heads together. I want to encourage you today. As all heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to read to you Luke 11, 9 through 10. These are the words of Jesus. He says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. <laughs>